What's up, heroes, and welcome to the Producer Life Podcast, episode 99. I've got a really special guest planned for episode 100, so make sure to listen till the end of the show to find out just who that is. Before we jump into the interview today, I wanted to also mention my new bootleg remix of Christina Aguilera and Ozuna's track, Santo, which is out now on YouTube and SoundCloud, but you should definitely check it out on YouTube because I've also got a music video to go along with it. I call it my Holy Smokes remix because that's an expression that somebody might say if they were surprised, but it's also because, well, there's a lot of smoke in it. So uh, yeah, check it out. Uh, It's a bass heavy remix and it plays on the religious language of the original Spanish track, which I absolutely love. I'll have a link in the show notes page, or you can go directly to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash house ninja music, one word. So Now, I've got the pleasure of introducing my guest for today, that is Ignacio Arfeli. Ignacio was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, There wasn't much of a techno scene there, so he moved to the Mecca for techno, Berlin. Ignacio's music blurs the line between the techno underground and the mainstream, and 2019 was really a breakout year for him as he landed some of the most respected labels in techno, including Kraftec, Suara, Octopus Records, and several more. Charlotte DeWitt has frequently opened festivals to his tracks, and he's had support from Alan Fitzpatrick, Eric Prids, Denson Pika, and DJ Rush. During the conversation, we talk about the challenges of picking up and moving from one country to another, the value of a music degree for a producer, and how to have better collaborations with other artists. But first, cue the intro music. All right, Ignacio, welcome to the Producer Life Podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I'm, I'm excited because you've got a really interesting, international, diverse background. So I'm excited <laughs> to hear about those, some of those different cultural experiences and how that's influenced your music. And uh, yeah. maybe we just start with how you got into music originally back in Buenos mm-hmm. Aires, right? In Buenos Aires, exactly. Yeah. So I would say everything started... Uh, six years ago in in Buenos Aires, like you said, um, I'm coming most for uh, from the EDM trap dubstep scene, you know, so it's very different from techno. Um, until one day, I I went to to see Carl Cox in Mandarin Park in Buenos Aires with one of my best friends there, and since that day until today, see, uh, yeah, I'm. Like I was, I don't know how to say, but uh, mind blowing, mind blow. Is that mm-hmm. I don't know if that correct? It, it blew your mind, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was literally so like in shock because of all the sounds I was uh, hearing. It was such a, an amazing experience, to be honest. Um, so yeah, this is how I I start to to make techno, basically. Okay, so in, inspired by Carl Cox, and uh, by yeah, the way, I got to comp- yeah, I, I, I got to compliment you on your English because not only do you speak very good English, but expressions like "blew your mind," you know that that makes no sense in another language. That's that's an, <laughs> that's very much an English. Uh, I guess it's an idiom. So um, I, I'm really impressed that you 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 know you you you're using those as well. So that's that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I wish I wish I spoke Spanish as well as you speak English. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, sometimes it's very, I, I don't know if, if very, but a little bit hard to understand me, but yeah, I think it's, it's fine. No, you have an accent, but that's, that's awesome. It's exotic <laughs> and it's cool. And, and, uh, so I thought you were in Germany, but it turns out you're in Portugal. So what took you yeah. on this globe hopping trip from Argentina to Germany and now to Portugal? So, uh, the decision, it took me around two years uh, to make like the, the big step and go to Germany. Um, and yeah, basically it was because of techno, because of music. I wanted to live from music. So I thought that the best option for me was to move to Europe. Mm-hmm. I was in Barcelona, in London, in Amsterdam, uh, in Berlin also. So I was kind of choosing the, the areas I wanted to live. 
and I decided to move to Berlin. I was living there almost three years, and because of the situation that we are facing now, restrictions and everything, and the weather, which is very important for me, and the weather in Berlin is insanely bad, <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> uh, me and my girlfriend decided to move to Portugal, um, yeah, mostly for for the weather. So, yeah, now, now we are here. We don't know if we are going to live uh, here for a long time, but we are pretty comfortable, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about sort of that transition, because that's interesting to me. You know, Germany, obviously, if you're a techno producer and using Ableton, there probably isn't a better physical location to be than Berlin, yeah. you know, the home of Ableton and the home, uh, you know, cer certainly a major mecca for techno. Yeah. What was, how did that sort of benefit or hinder you while you were there? I mean, was it kind of, was the market saturated? Everybody does techno, so it was hard to get a gig or was it like, oh, you do techno, perfect, come play? No, no, no. The, the market is very saturated. Um, yeah, for me, it was a little bit, of course, difficult because, you know, I was coming from Argentina and from Argentina to Germany, it's a huge step, not only for for my career, but also the culture itself. It's so different. I had to to study German. I'm speaking a little bit of German. Um, so it was <laughs> a little bit shocking at the beginning. Um, but yeah, then I started to meet some producers, some agents. Um, I could play not a lot, but in a, in a few private parties, then official parties. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't say it was easy for me, but not so difficult. I would say in the middle, you know, so, so it was yeah. mostly difficult for, because of the language, uh, I would say yeah. for me, the language was pretty, pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a huge step. You know, here in the United States, like if you want to be a country western artist, you know, the the, the place to go is Nashville, Tennessee. Um, but mm -hmm. they speak yeah. the same language as you know, it's all English here. So that that had to have been a a monumental decision to move to a totally different country halfway around the world where you didn't even speak the language to yeah. uh, to to follow your dreams there. So uh, I, I mean, I I would. I wouldn't say that they don't speak in English because they most of them speak in English. But you know, when you have to, when you want to have maybe a deep connection with them, it's nice to talk their language. You know, so yeah, for me that was a very very big step. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not saying that I speak German fluent, but I can defend myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> All right, so then you transitioned to Portugal, I think, last year, right? It was last year, yes, in September. Okay, so that was that was largely a decision based on the weather. And uh, <laughs> I actually visited Portugal two or three years ago. I was there for a couple of weeks in, in Lisbon, and, mm -hmm. Lisbon and, and also visited Spain and Madrid and, and whatnot. Beautiful country, low cost yeah. of living, great food. What was that transition like for you and, and uh, how hard was it to sort of reestablish yourself as an artist? Um, okay. The transition from Germany to Portugal, it wasn't difficult at all. In fact, I feel very like like home here in Portugal. Um, because, in the, of course, the weather reminds me a lot to Argentina. Um, this is the, the personal side. The artist side, I would say that is a little bit hard, but having the like the proper contacts, you you could make it here. I'm having a few contacts that uh, we are going to start to throw uh, parties in March uh, here in the Algarve. I'm living in Lagos, uh, so yeah, let's see how how it goes. But I think I'm I'm doing. Pretty well. It wasn't that hard than than in Germany, I would say. Okay. Is there a lot of uh, is techno big down there, or what? What are sort of the dominant genres in Portugal? Where, uh, you are? where I'm living, techno it's it's not the thing at all. The, here you can listen more reggaeton and, and all this stuff. Um, but I would say in Lisbon, there's I don't know if a huge scene, but there's a very big scene. Uh, of techno and very very interesting parties and festivals so 
Yeah. Okay. So you're going to throw some of your own and then uh, uh, try to jump in on those as well, I assume. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Now you've still got a language barrier down there, right? Because Portuguese is very different than Spanish. It is different, but you can understand them and they can understand you. It's not that hard, but of course, you know, for respect, uh, I have to talk a little bit of Portuguese. Um, okay. Like, you know, like, like in Germany, I, I think for me, it's a matter of respect to, to learn, to learn the, the language of the country that, that you are. Um, so, yeah, basically that. Okay. That's, that's good advice for anybody changing countries. Um, do you have any other advice for producers and DJs that might want to move to a very different, a different area, maybe, maybe not a different country or, or maybe so what, what should they do to get ready before they make a dramatic move like that? Well, uh, it's a hard question because, you know, it's very personal. I think every, everyone is, is different, but I can say that you have to be very, very patient um, and respect the, the country or the place you are. Like, try, at least try to to connect with them in their language because believe me or not this is very important this could open f- uh, for you a lot of doors and it's it's true actually if, if they see that you put the effort at least you know to speak a little bit of their language um, it's a good sign for them whatever the country you are I think yeah Okay, so give the language a shot, even even if you know you're going to speak with a horrible accent, give it yeah, a try. Yeah, anyway, it's, 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 it's the effort that, you, that you're putting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, now, you've you've actually got a degree in music production, is that right? I have, uh, yes, two actually, yes, two degrees. Okay, so uh, what are the titles of those degrees? Music production and what else? Uh, one is music. Uh, okay, it's a technical music production. I, I don't know exactly in English how how do you say, but it's yeah, basically it's a um, it's a certificate of electronic music production. Uh, that's the first one, and the second one it's a sound engineering, but mm-hmm. specify in music production. Okay, uh, as opposed to like movies or something like that. Exactly, and also how to record bands and and drums and you know more like more organic instruments not 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 so electronic okay so what were i guess the first question is do you do you recommend that to other producers so young producers that are maybe thinking about going into the music industry mm-hmm. should they pursue a four year degree or or two year degree in music production or should they are, are there enough other opportunities out there on youtube and producer groups to to learn things these days that that's not yeah i, I think nowadays I, I will not say that it's not a must to study in a university like like i did for example but because of all the information that you have in the internet, I think it's really enough to to study on YouTube, for example, or you can buy a course, I don't know. Um, but of course, what a university or, or a college, I don't know, gives you, it's the discipline. So if you are not a disciplined person and you want to study by yourself, like in YouTube, for example, maybe that's not the best option for you, but if you are not disciplined. In terms of music, I consider myself very disciplined and hard worker. So for me, even if I have degree, um, studying from YouTube wouldn't be a problem. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, That sounds like good advice. Um, Yeah. Do you still hear your professors in your head any? Are there there any bits of advice that they offered you that you keep coming back to as you are producing music? From my teachers, you mean? Yes. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just talking only with one, but the thing is that the teachers that I had, they were not producing techno at all. They were more into the deep house and house industry. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not having any connection with them. Okay. All right. So that was 
Now, where was that degree? Was that in Germany or was that in um, Argentina? Uh, okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, the first degree was in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, in EMBA. Uh, it's mus um, EMBA Escuela de Música de Buenos Aires, uh, Music School of Buenos Aires, Buenos mm -hmm. Aires Music School. Um, and the second one, it was in DBS, that now they changed the, their name for Cat Catalyst, I think. Uh, but two years ago, it was DBS, Music Berlin. And yeah, the second one was in, in Berlin, in Germany. Okay. All right. Uh, and was it in Germany where you really started performing on a regular basis or was were you already doing that while you were in Argentina? Um, no, no, no. I would say in, in Europe. Yeah, I think in Europe, started it started everything in Europe for me, like professionally speaking. In Argentina, of course, I was having gigs and some parties, but it, I mean, when, when I say professional, I say, I mean, in, in terms of paying, you know, getting money and start to mm -hmm. to live uh, from music in this case. Yeah. yeah, I would say that everything started here in Europe. So okay. it's, in, it's almost three years. Yeah. A lot of my listeners are sort of at that transitional phase from, hey, this is a hobby to, hey, I think I could make some money at it. Yeah. Tell me about that transition for you. How did that, how did that happen from, from, you know, maybe bedroom producer to, you know, professional who's, who's touring and performing, performing regularly? Um, well, for me, to be very honest, it wasn't very difficult in terms of support. You know, my family supports me a lot with this. Um, so I am, I am very, very grateful of that. Um, shout out so, mom and dad. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah, they are, they are the best. I mean, literally I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Um, okay. mostly because they, they also push me to, to go to Germany because I wasn't so sure. Of course I had my, my fears, you know, and, and everything. Uh, but they they pushed me to do it and and yeah I, I would say it wasn't difficult in in that term but in in another side for example like playing uh, for me that was a little bit difficult to to afford because I I didn't know anyone literally anyone uh, so I, I had to start from zero again um, so yeah. I would say that in in terms of support, it, it wasn't difficult, but in terms of start to having gigs and make contacts and and all that, it was it was a little bit difficult. And still, nowadays, yeah. Okay, so so how did you approach that? Did you just start going out to clubs and meeting people, or was it a? Did you spend a lot of time on social media, reaching out to people and labels? Yeah, or? That, the, the the last one. I spent a lot of time in social media, and. Yeah, just con uh, contacting artists, um, m mostly artists, I would say, because I'm I consider myself more a producer than an DJ, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, nowadays, in fact, I'm writing music for for artists. Uh, I'm making mix and mastering, uh, track arrangement. So I'm, I consider myself more a producer, but of course, I love to DJ. I love to DJ. Um, so yeah, the, everything was via Facebook or even Instagram. Um, so yeah, that's that, that's how I made and still making my contacts nowadays. That's interesting because you moved all the way across the world to go to Berlin, and then you wound up making a lot of your contacts online anyway. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the thing with, Ber with Berlin, of course, is that the contacts I did. Be, uh, via Facebook, for example, then I could meet them in person, you know, and, and to have some beers and talk. So, I mean, I, I would say it was virtual, like a virtual um, contact, but at the same time, you you could see them in person, you know, you, you could meet them and they have some beers and, and all that stuff. Got it. So you, you were looking for artists that are also doing techno that were, you know, in the local area so that you could, you could go meet them. And then were you yes. looking for collaboration opportunities or performance opportunities or how did those conversations go with them? For my side, it was more collaboration opportunities uh, for, um, for tracks and maybe make some EPs for big record labels to, 
to have the contact then in the future. Uh, this is how I managed to ha- to to work you know, for Alan Fitzpatrick and We Are the Brave and Octopus Recordings uh, because of these contacts. So I, I was contact some artists and say, hey, I have this track. Would you like to maybe make a collaboration and send it to Octopus Recordings because I saw that you are in this record label and I don't know, I reopened to to help me <laughs> or not. Uh, yeah, th- th- this is how I... I did this and I'm still doing, I'm still doing it. Um, okay. So yeah, it's like a, we, we help each other in a way. Is it hard collaborating where you feel like you're, do you feel like you're giving up some portion of your art? Not, not just from the perspective of like royalties, but from the perspective of, mm. Hey, it's maybe a little less of mine because somebody else is working on it too. Or yeah, well, with collaborations, you have to be very open to new ideas and you have to understand that not all your, your ideas are good <laughs> and, and, and not all your your colleague ideas are good. So I think you have to be really open to, to collaborate and have a, a successful EP. Um, it requires a lot of patience, a lot, because it's not something that you will have that, that you you will not finish in one week. Uh, for example, I have a I had a collaboration with Mark Michael, uh, which is a producer from Austria, and we had a very good connection. We are friends. He's a very nice guy, and we had DCP. We made DCP for KD Raw which is a German record label. And it took us around four months to finish the EP. So <laughs> imagine it was a lot of adjustments, a lot of this idea is not so good. Maybe we could add this. Maybe we should delay this. I don't know. It was a little bit, um, I, I wouldn't say difficult, but uh, a lot of, uh, I don't know, new, new ideas every single day. So one day we had to say, okay, enough. Let's let's finish this because otherwise we are going to produce DCP for the rest of our life, and this is not <laughs> what we want. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you you had to be patient. Yeah. When when you were collaborating with a lot of these other producers, particularly during the pandemic, were you just doing that over phone or Zoom or sending stems over email, or were you? Um, we're using some sort of a plugin like satellite that lets you guys collaborate real time. Yeah, I hear about this plugin. I never use it, but for example, with Mark, it was by phone. We were calling each other and say, "Hey, man, I have this idea. Uh, I will send you. I will let you know that I will send you a message from SoundCloud, uh, and yeah, take a listen and let me know what you think." Okay. Yeah, it was basically uh, by phone. Sometimes uh, could happen that you, you you can understand the point of view of the artist very well, and you can finish the idea in less than two hours. I mean, this this happened in fact with the track that I have with Mark as well. Um, but it's very weird, you know, that this happened. Mo- most of the times you are struggling with ideas, and and yeah, it's ba- basically like this. Okay. And, and I guess it's sort of the last question on this on this sort of topic was yeah. when you're looking for people to collaborate with, obviously you're looking for people that produce music similar to yours, but are you yeah. were you reaching for artists that were dramatically had bigger followings than you or just, you know, a little bit above where you were? Or was there any thought process like that? Like, hey, I like this guy's music. I'm going to see what he says. Uh, no, uh, for me, I think it's very important to have first the like the human connection. Uh, I, I don't care if you have one million followers and if that will help me for my career. If I don't have a good connection with you, I will not collaborate because, like I like I told you, collaboration is something that you require you require time. You know, so um, you have to stay in contact with these artists not every day, but. Um, most of the weeks and and there has to be a connection first and of course the the second thing I would say is that 
he or she has to make it has to produce the the techno that I that I make also or, or it has to be a little bit similar and and we have to share the same point of view in terms of which record label we want to send the the EP. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So that's something you guys, you discuss early on, Hey, we're going to put this together and here's the types of record labels and, and you make yeah, sure you've got a connection with, with them. With Mark, for example, we made in a paper, we made a list and we, we wrote, I think say five or six record labels where we say, okay, we are working DCP and these are the record labels that we are going to send the, the demos. Of course, not, not we didn't send DP to, to the to these five record labels at the same time, you know, we had to we send one EP for a record label. We wait like a month. They say no. Okay, let's move to the, to the other record label and like this. Is is that a usual amount of time you were having between you know submitting and then hearing back from them? It was a month. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to work with big record labels and you are not so popular, yes, you had to wait a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can see it. So like the EP you guys did, it, you said it took you four months to put it together. Then how many months did it take to actually find a label? And then how many months before they actually distributed it? It took one year and three months, I guess. Whew, start to finish. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So patience. That was, I, I think that was the first thing you, you said. Yeah, exactly. You That's why I said you had to be very patient sometimes. Okay. So for so for producers that are listening that are not familiar with your music, and I'm of course going to link link your SoundCloud in the show notes page. Yeah. But um, can you give us a brief description? I mean, how would you when somebody asks what your sound is, what do you tell them? Yeah. Well, I would say uh, modern, um, atmospheric, energetic, dark, and sometimes so. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if I would say funny, but yeah, sometimes I put some funny sounds in the background, you know, just just for me. <laughs> it's not for for the for my followers or for the people who listen to my music, but yeah, I I would say mostly dark energetic, modern and and fast, of course also. Yeah. Okay. I would say fast, um, yeah. The funny background sound sounds like that has an interesting story. What can you give us some examples of background sounds you've thrown in and why you did it? <laughs> yeah, I, I have a track called "It's This, this People Called Apex Twin." Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a very, how do you say? Uh, I'm very addicted to YouTube, mm-hmm. so I watch a lot of videos. Uh, th- doesn't matter the the topic. I watch a lot of videos. Mm-hmm about anything. So I discovered a girl talking about Aphex Twin, that she thought that Aphex Twin was a band, but Aphex Twin is only one guy, um, which is a legend in the electronic uh, music scene. And yeah, I find it very funny because she was talking about him in a very shocking way because this artist, for for those who, who, doesn't, who don't know, uh, it's a very, very experimental UK artist. Um, you can listen to his tracks and maybe you, you can listen to a baby crying in the background with growl bass, also like all combined and very weird scenes with a lo-fi hip-hop beat. So it, it's very, very weird, but so interesting. And this girl is the, you know, the typical... A mainstream girl that listens to EDM and goes to I don't know Tomorrowland and all these festivals, and of course for her the first time listening to FX Twin it was shocking, and yeah she was talking in a very funny way about him so I, I decided to put this a uh, voice note in a track, and I sent this to Alan Fitzpatrick and now he's playing it in every single <laughs> gig and it's so funny and I find <laughs> it so funny. Yeah, I, mean, I would love to see her face the first time she hears her voice on the track. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I want that, but yeah, maybe she will discover it if I sign the track. Yeah, yeah, interesting. It, it It's fun when you find a unique sample or, or something that you can incorporate into your music. I yeah. The track that I just released, 
here in the United States, we've got robocalls. I don't know if you get those in uh, Portugal, but you know, those automated calls wanting you to buy something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah. So, so, um, I got a robo call on my voicemail and, and so I wound up incorporating that into a, tr- an angry electro house track about, you know, robo calls <laughs> and how frustrating they are. So nice. it, it was fun though. It was fun though. I got, got good feedback on it. Um, yeah. And actually I, I will say that what I did, I mean, it's not unique of course, but it's something very different from, you can listen in, in techno nowadays in the, in the amazing mainstream techno. Um, and it got people attention a lot. So the, I, I received so many message about uh, messages about this track. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. Okay. Well, let's let's talk. Let's pivot and talk about your music specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, your your most recent release was that my heart. The most recent release it's uh, in my heart. Yes, in Codex recordings. Okay, awesome. Um, so yeah. I, the vocal mix is the one that's on uh, uh, Spotify, which which I really like. Um, Thank you. Can you tell us about um, tell us a little bit about that track and how it came about? Yeah, this track has already uh, two years. It was a track that I had in my folder. I, I to be honest, I never wanted to release it because I thought it was too mainstream and too commercial for techno in in those days. But now I see that techno is becoming even more, I, I would not say EDM, but it's becoming definitely more commercial and also more open to new ideas, which I I really like it. So, yeah, I, I decided to to put this vocal. Originally, it was the, the instrumental mix, which I also released. It. Um, that was the original song. But in I, I was in Splice. I was searching for some vocals, but just for... For spending time, I, I wasn't. I was not thinking to put a vocal on, on in my heart, to be honest. But I found um, a vocal in a trap uh, folder. Uh, this uh, a cappella vocal. I don't know how how to say it. A cappella. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I just I, I tweak it a little bit. I I pitch it up three semitones, um, and yeah, it, it fits very well. So, yeah. I send it then to Spartak. He he likes it, and yeah, we release we release the EP. Okay, so you the track was basically done, and then you threw the vocal over on top of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the track like I told you it has it had uh, two years. I made it two years ago, and I thought it was too commercial to to release it. <laughs> so I just saved it in my folder and and was waiting for the. For, for the proper time to, to release it. And by discovering this vocal, something resonated in me and I said, hmm, maybe this could work in in the track. And yeah, then I, I named it in my heart. Okay. You've made the distinction a couple times between like mainstream commercial techno and, and sort of the underground sound that, yeah. that you gravitate towards. Can you characterize the difference between like mainstream techno and underground techno what, what what is the sonic difference there for me the underground techno it's like you know ben clock the german artist i, I don't i'll have to look him up uh it's, yeah it's, it's like i would say the berlin techno in general uh, more hypnotic uh, with very dark percussions and the same sound going on over and over again. I will, for me, this is very underground and, and of course, um, very experimental. And mainstream techno, for me, is techno bunker in Spotify or the top 100 uh, Bitport chart. I will mm-hmm. say that this is very mainstream, but in my case, I really like it. I, I see many colleagues and people in general that they don't like that techno is becoming more mainstream. I could understand because there are a lot of patterns and ideas that are very like the same over and over. I, I can understand that. But at the same time, for me, I think it's very positive for the genre if it's not too much saturated um, from the same ideas because you're opening a lot of doors that maybe people from the EDM scene, they they didn't know about techno and now they are starting to to listen to techno more and more and 
artists like me are start to being known because of this. So I don't find it, I, I don't find it uh, as a as a bad thing. But I would say mainstream techno is definitely techno bunker, like the this playlist in Spotify. Okay, is, is it fair to say then that underground techno is is generally kind of minimal techno? Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. I, I would say the the Berlin techno, for example, is very hypnotic and it's like a constant loop over and over again, and it's maybe a track of five five thirty uh, five minutes five minutes thirty seconds, but it's with a loop over and over again. And with a lot of experimentation in the background, it could be with percussions, with synthesizers, um, and of course, in this scene or in this type of ger- uh, style, um, you, I mean, it's not that you cannot use vocals and and all this, but it's a little bit weird to use vocals if it's not in a very experimental way. And I find that in mainstream techno, you can use, for example, a pop vocal or a house vocal, a tech house vocal, and it's fine. If it works, it works. And if people like it, they will let you know that they like it. I think that maybe in the underground, this is a little bit closed, you know? I would not say closed-minded, but like there are some rules maybe to follow. Um, I was doing actually raw techno, hypnotic techno, underground techno, and now I'm making the mainstream techno because I feel that I have more options and and I have more freedom in terms of ideas. So yeah. Okay. Is it easier to produce underground techno because you're dealing with fewer elements? No, it's not easy at all. I guess what I'm asking is, is it easier to produce than mainstream techno where you're dealing with vocals, which are always a challenge and maybe more elements in the mix? So is it- No, I, I would say both styles are very difficult to make because, for example, in, in the underground techno, you think that you have only maybe one or two loops constantly in the track, like for five minutes. So you have to really concentrate in five minutes to make the track interesting for people who listen to that track, but at the same time, uh, you you have to have one sound, you know. So the track that the track doesn't have to be bored, um, and you have to work a lot with textures, with automations so much. You have to automate almost everything. Um, no, no, I, I would say that underground techno is very difficult to to produce. And mainstream, of course, when you have to work with vocals, with a lot of synthesizers and use layers and everything, um, the, the, the mixing part, mostly it's, for me, it's very difficult, but excited, exciting at the same time, because I really like it. I really like to mix. Okay. And so you mix and master all your own, own tracks? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Awesome. Talk to me about some more of your favorite tracks. Um, do you have any that jump, jump to mind? That- um, yeah, I would say this track I, I told you is this people call FX Twin. This mm-hmm. is one of my favorite tracks by far that I, that I did. Um, I really enjoy it. And in my heart also. In my heart, I really like it. It's very fresh and and the vocal, I think, fits very well with the, with the chord progression in the background. Okay. Do you have a, a general workflow or a template that you use, or do you kind of start everything with a blank slate? No, every time I start uh, with an empty project, what I have is um, when, for example, I, I upload an audio channel in Ableton Live, I already have uh, the plugins there that I'm going to use. So, for example, I upload channel one audio, and I have a Trash 2, which is a multiband saturator. Then I have the Pro-Q3. Yeah, sorry, Trash 2. I have a saturator from Ableton. Then I have the Pro-Q3. Um, and that's, let's say, the, the main chain. And, and from that, I start to... If I see that the sound needs more work, I, I start to add more plugins. Okay. 
So you've got a few plugins on each track. Do you put those same ones, Trash 2 and, and uh, Pro-Q3, do you put those on every track or is yeah. that just... Th- those okay. one goes to every single track, yes. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And then do you have like a standard mastering chain you start with on the master track or is that vary by track? Um, no, I, I would say the, the standard mastering chain, it's um, a compressor. It's a townhouse from Plugin Alliance, which is amazing. Um, maybe, uh, how do you say, image stereo from Osotop. Yeah, uh, stereo stereo imager from Isotope. Stereo imager, yeah, exactly that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, an exciter, also a multiband exciter, and yeah, then a limiter because it's just it's just for the demo. You know, it's it's not very very professional, but professional enough to to send us a demo and 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 for artists to to taste the tracks uh, live. Okay, so so do you? Just to backtrack to to marketing to labels, or do you generally wait till you finish the tracks before you send them out to labels, or you send the demos first and then you keep working on the tracks? No, no, no. Every time I send a demo, it's completely finished, one hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. And then when you're starting a techno track, do you where where do you begin? Do you begin with a kick or uh, your chords, or is there any particular mm-hmm. place? Um, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not following a, a pattern. In this it depends on my on my creativity. I would say sometimes I start with a melody. Sometimes with just the kick and the bass. Sometimes with a, perca- a percussion, hi hat. It really depends. It, it depends also on the on the track I want to approach. It depends also in the record label I want to work for. So if if I want to sign an EP or if I want to work an EP for a, a more melodic record label, I will start from the melody or maybe I will write some pads and some arpeggios. Um, and if I want to work for record labels that are a little bit more underground and more groovy, I, I'm starting uh, with yeah some maybe percussions, the kick, hi-hat, etc. Yeah. Okay. Tell me about uh, my heart. So, how did that one sort of flow? Uh, my heart. Um, it's a nice, nice question because this was now like three years ago. And oh, jeez, all right. <laughs> I can't remember it so well. But okay. tell, uh, tell me about a more recent one. Then, yeah. is there one that you particularly want to? One that you're sort of promoting right now that uh, you'd like to no, talk about? But, I could talk about maybe about uh, is this people call FX Twin. Yep. Um, it's an unreleased track. It's not signed yet, but I think it will be signed in a few days, fortunately, for a record label that I, I can say, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but yeah, this track it, uh, started with a group. I, I, I was focusing since, I, I'm focused since two months in the group because I feel that it's something that I'm missing in my tracks and in my productions. So I was literally studying um, every single artist that I find that they are very good in in groovy tracks, in percussion, uh, hi-hats, etc. So I was focusing 100% on that. And this track, it's literally just a kick, a, a very catchy groove, I would say. A few hi hats, and then this girl talking about Apex Twin, and then you have a very big scene, a synth going on in the d- during the drop, uh, and it's basically that this track, but it works, it's working very well, I would say. Okay, great. Well, well, good luck. Do you have? Uh, do you. you know when that might come out? No, I have no idea, but I think if I sign this. It will come out. Maybe it will come out. I think in the summer, in July or November. So I, I have okay. to wait a little bit. Well, awesome, awesome. I, I understand that you, uh, when when you're not producing music, you enjoy comedy. Like, uh, is is that stand up comedy or? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a stand up comedy sketch uh, sketches. Um, yeah, I'm a big big fan of comedy. Big fan. Yeah. 
what uh do you ever go to improv shows Sorry? improvisational Im- improvisational comedy where where the audience gives uh suggestions to the actors and they'll come up with funny skits just based on the audience's suggestions uh, but you mean if i will do this or no 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 no. have you ever seen one ah yes of course in buenos aires i was there was a time that i was going to every single stand-up comedy um yeah, yeah, yeah. I was doing this a lot, and, and I enjoy so much um, American and and Ricky Gervais. I don't know if you know him. To UK, oh, yeah. yeah. I I really like the um, how do you say it? dark humor, the very like it's it's very Argentinian humor. I would say that we we make jokes about <laughs> things that maybe it's, it's not so political correct. So you have to be very careful. Uh, but this I, I enjoyed very much. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's got to be very difficult um, in many cases trying to catch humor in different languages because it seems like a lot of humor relies on exactly um, you know cultural references. Or, different countries, humor it's very very different. Yeah, yeah. That's that's awesome. Though. I, mean, I imagine that's also a good way to to learn about the culture and sort of what resonates with people there. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so aside from this uh, new track that you've got, what what else is going on for you, and and what are your plans for this coming year? Well, my plans is to start to play again uh, in March. I think I will start uh, to play in Portugal again because now all the restrictions are are starting to to finish. I think. I hope. <laughs> yeah, uh, we all hope. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because I, I didn't tell you, but I had I was going to have a tour in Mexico and USA and Colombia, but because of COVID, it was cancelled, oh. um, and for the second time. So yeah, um, yeah. So now, now I have to to be playing in Portugal, and then in the production production side side, um, I. I don't know. I, I, I just have a, an EP coming on April uh, in Respect Recordings. It's Spectre record label. Um, um, yeah, just like always, making music, keep studying, uh, and keep trying to improve my, my quality. Okay. Well, that, that sounds great. And, and where can people find you online? They can find me on Instagram. My Instagram is Ignacio Arfeli Oficial. Uh, SoundCloud Ignacio Arfeli. Bitport Ignacio Arfeli. And yeah, I think that's it. Okay, great. I, I will make sure links are in the show notes page. And, and uh, again, I really appreciate your time Thank today. You. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening today. Please take a sec to leave a rating and review wherever you're listening right now. I would really appreciate that. It would also be awesome if you headed over to youtube.com slash house ninja music and check out that Santo remix and leave me a comment and let me know what you think about it. As always, I'll have lots of links for you on the show notes page. If you go to producerlifepodcast.com and look for episode 99, I'll have links for everything, Ignacio, uh, Spotify, SoundCloud, socials, you got it. I promised a special guest for episode 100, and it is Alex Holmes. Alex is an English singer and songwriter for pop and EDM and has worked with hundreds of producers and labels worldwide. Her music has garnered millions of streams. She's been endorsed by Tiesto, Hardwell, and Armin Van Buren, and she's been featured on records with Sean Paul and Pitbull, and she has releases on Universal, Sony Music, and Spinning Records. It was an awesome interview you definitely want to hear, so make sure you hit the subscribe button today. Until episode 100, this is the House Ninja, reminding you to be somebody's hero today. <laughs>